All right, uh, welcome everyone, and uh, especially all of you who had to adjust your schedules today uh, because of the uh, the United States keeps continues to observe daylight savings time uh, on its own uh, clock uh, compared to everybody else. But um, I'm glad that we have so many people here. And of course, it will be recorded and made available. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome on behalf of the History of Economic Society and the University of Lyon uh, and Rebecca and Miriam. Uh, Edith Cooper, who will be here to talk about uh, progressivism um, abortion and eugenics. Um, so I think it'll be a very interesting discussion. And uh, many of you may know Edith's recent book, Her Story, uh, which uh, somewhat connects, I would think, right? at least uh, in the time period. Anyway, it's a wonderful book. And if you haven't had a chance to look at it, I highly recommend it. Here comes Rebecca, she's made it. <laughs> All right, so I was just introducing Edith and uh, I guess if you're ready to go, I will turn off my microphone. Okay, well, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, sorry, thank you, uh, Marianne, uh, and also Rebecca and uh, Miriam for inviting me, for organizing this uh, seminar, which is kind of quite amazing, I must say. Um, and um, let me share my screen. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about eugenics and abortion and progressivism. So uh, I would like to kind of uh, keep on the format that has been used in this seminar. Uh, so I would like to start with some key statements and then uh, explain how things are set up. And at the very end of my presentation, I have some central references for anybody who's interested, but particularly for the students of Rebecca. Um, so um, my focus will be on kind of bringing in the, the uh, eugenics uh, approach uh, and explore uh, how that um, uh, relates to um, pro progressivism, uh, progressivism uh, and the uh, thinking about abortion is economic. Okay, just a trigger warning for those who are sensitive to that, we'll be talking about abortion, which can become quite explicit. So please be aware and take care of yourself. Okay, some key, key statements then is um, the first one, eugenicist ideas around population growth, immigration, causes of poverty become part of economic thinking in the US in the first decade of the 20th century. So these notions are also taken up by progressives and these were economists, but also feminist <coughs> activists and policy makers. So um, part of this group, Home economists, they claim women as experts on consumption, on household behavior, um, and um, as such, they, you could say, claim the field. Okay, eugenicist policymaking involved data collection, that's where they start out, and then they uh, propagate the segregation of certain groups forced sterilization, limitation to immigration, specific groups, and as an extreme and final solution is a term that was used, extermination, okay? And then abortion becomes a topic of public concern and policymaking during the second half of the 19th century. I'll talk a bit about the context when conservative strategists start to use the concept of the right of the fetus. The mo movement of, for uh, birth control it comes up uh, in the 20th century, distances itself increasingly from abortion why, while propagating contraceptives. Okay, so the organizing of my the organization of my talk will be first the uh, development of eugenic movement, then the propagation of eugenic ideas by early economists, um, the contribution of progressive thinkers to the eugenic movement and the use of um, eugenic notions in their thinking, and then the debates on abortion located in this field of tension. Okay, let's see. 
Right, so we have been talking in this seminar uh, about uh, this kind of uh, bringing back a new memory, um, these these discussions um, that uh, Marianne talked about, that, that Miriam talked about, um, uh, and that is that political economists, classical economists like Adam Smith, Jeremy Bentham, Thomas Malthus, David Ricardo, James Mill, John Stuart Mill, and others, they um, took population growth, um, into account and uh, they were interested how population growth had an impact on national economic growth, on the wages, on poverty, on inequality. Uh, so population growth was an inherent part of the study uh, of the economy. So for instance, too high population growth was perceived as to cause poverty uh, and um, um, population growth in itself was perceived as being caused by lack of moral restraint and immorality. So, so population growth was 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 part of 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 the um, of the economic forces, so to say. What we see is that too low population growth due to immigration, decline of fertility rates, especially on the middle and upper class uh, in the United States, becomes an issue. Uh, and invokes anxiety around the health and the race and the quality of the race at the end of the 19th century. Okay, so this is where I more or less start. So I would like to start with the emergence and the rise of evolutionary and Darwinist thought. So it's in 1859 that Charles Darwin publishes his Origin of the Species and Herbert Spencer has his first book in 1851. Um, so their reasoning is that um, Charles Darwin was, uh, uh, wrote about the evolution of the species, right, focused primarily on the biological world. Um, and when he talks about the uh, about society, he, he says that working class should not use contraception uh, and abortion, not really necessary. Let just let evolution take its takes its course. So, uh, what he says about women is that women are more focused than men uh, on uh, sexual selection. And in general, they are less developed than men. It's a really rough uh, report on, on Darwin, but I think that covers most of it. Um, Herbert Spencer then applies evolutionary thought to analyze and describe uh, human society. Right. So initially in his um, in book on statistics in 1851, he states women and men as basically equal, but that changes later on. So later on, he really uh, perceives uh, men as, as, as uh, particularly uh, white men, Anglo-Saxon men as higher, uh, as, as, as higher developed than women. Women were considered to be more focused on the reproduction and on raising children. He also ranks cultures, he describes them in various stages of development. Um, and uh, for Spencer, um, the um, race, so to say, that is able to free up women's time to totally focus on the uh, birthing and raising of children is, he perceives that as the highest stage of, of, of evolution, of development. So these are evolutionary thinkers, right? And it's good to really distinguish those from the eugenic thinkers. Um, in the second half of the 18th century, um, eugenics um, develops. It's Francis Galton, Galton, who coined the term eugenics, which stands for good breeding. Um, uh, eugenics as such describes a movement to improve human heredity by the social control of human breeding, based on the assumption that the differences in human intelligence, character, temperament, later that's being added as, you know, the kind of um, physical uh, features like blindness and deafness and, 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 and other um, uh, features, that they are largely due to differences in heredity. Okay, we'll talk more about that. Positive eugenics, or is a distinct, you can make a distinction, was made at the time between positive and negative eugenics. And Galton was particularly interested in, in positive eugenics, although he also talks about negative eugenics. And positive eugenics 
is the idea that um, uh, healthy uh, people, mostly middle class and, and higher class uh, Anglo-Saxon Nordic um, people, um, would 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 be good to have them breed among themselves so that you would have more people that um, that uh, were um, genetically healthy that are the healthy stock of the uh, the population would grow larger than than the uh, deficient uh, people so to say so uh, Galton is really interested in bringing about a, a race of geniuses so to say um Carl Pearson is much younger. Here they are. The left one is uh, the on the picture is is Pearson. The right one is Galton, uh, and he kind of follows in the footsteps of Galton. He um, names the li library for national eugenics that Galton started. He named that the Galton Galton Labor Laboratory for uh, National Eugenics, and Pearson. Um, uh, Put the focus on what towards negative eugenics. So negative eugenics aims at limiting the or preventing the reproduction of what was considered degenerate and unfit families. So, okay. Um, when we look at the British economists and how they use eugenic reasoning, um, uh, what comes to the fore is this group of Fabians that is active in London. H.G. Um, Wells was part of that. Um, Shaw was part of that. And they were all into eugenic thinking. So um, Sydney and Beatrice Webb, you see them here on the picture. Sydney's on the very left. And in the right corner is Beatrice Potter Webb. And then you have the Shaws sitting next to them, between them, sorry. So uh, Sydney and Beatrice Potter Webb, for instance, but mostly in all of their work uh, in industrial democracy in 1897, they talk about um, people as um, and those deficient of intellect, the epileptic, the mentally ill. They characterize those as the feeble-minded, uh, the, cri the criminal, and those who are incapable of pr producing their own maintenance at any application whatsoever. These people were perceived and be, as being deficient in character, as being morally deficient. And then the uh, argument develops in such an extent that these people should be separated out, should be segregated, and should be, um, uh, in the end, uh, be made extinct. William Stanley Devons applies similar notions. He claims in a theory of moral, uh, theory of political economy that he cannot distinguish between uh, Aboriginal people, but he can distinguish between Anglo-Saxons. But I'll have a quote uh, of him later on. Somebody else, William Beveridge, who's really important in the development of British welfare state, is also Fabian. He's a faculty member of the LSE, uh, and he was actively involved in the building of the eugenic so society and movement in uh, London. Alfred Marshall also applies evolutionary thinking, but also eugenic notions. So um, I'll talk a bit about that more about that. And then we have John Maynard Keynes, right? So these are big names in uh, economics that use eugenic notions in various ways and to various extent, but that's important to realize. Okay, so um, for instance, a few quotes, William Janice Stanley Jevons, he, um, uh, for him, questions of this kind, and then he talks about the work effort, depends greatly upon the character of the race. Persons of an energetic disposition feel labor less painfully than their fellow men. And if they happen to be endowed with various and acute sensibilities, their desire of further acquisition never ceases. A man of a lower race, a Negro, for instance, enjoys possession less and loathes labor more. His extensions therefore soon stop, right? Put it differently, um, um, Negroes are more lazy, they're less ambitious, they're less interested in material goods. Poor savage would be content to gather the almost capricious fruits of nature if they were sufficient to give sustenance. It is only physical want which drives them to exertion. 
it's kind of interesting um, how this language and these notions develop in England also um, when talking about Irish people, right? So this is kind of, you could say, based, heavily based in class and then subsequently in, in, in race. Alfred Marshall uses similar term and terminology, savage life ruled by custom and impulse, savage life is ruled by custom and impulse, never forecasting the distant future, seldom providing for need future, servitude to custom, fitful, governed, governed by fancy of the moment, in, incapable of steady work. You could say a whole bunch of prejudices are here put together and projected on what's considered a lower race. Okay, so what happens, uh, and this is what we'll be focusing on, what happens in the United States, right? It's, it's particularly negative eugenics that moves to the United States. So in the United States, it's Charles B. Davenport, who is crucial in the foundation of, your, of the eugenic movement. He published a whole range of books. This is one of them, Eugenics, the Science of Human Improvement Through Better Breeding. There is this, in the beginning, close connection between the um, um, Association for Breeding, uh, Agricultural uh, Association for Breeding, uh, and, and there's also a heavy, heavy um, uh, foundation for eugenics in the Department of Agriculture in the United States. So he founds this station for experimental study of uh, evolution in Cold Spring, that is Long Island, New York. And what he does at the beginning of the movement is they start with gathering data, right? Data and, and in gathering data, they develop their arguments, their, 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 their theories, uh, and they ask public institutions and newly founded institutions that they kind of push to be founded, uh, and these institutions, like schools, like um, hospitals, like mental institutions, in the beginning, they are really kind of naive and they just send over all their data, whereas some of these institutions become more wary when they um, realize what's being, how these um, data sets are being used, right? So, um, but uh, to, to organize this data collection, the Eugenic Records Office in New York is being uh, founded and uh, um, plays a coordinating role in the movement. That is not possible. The whole growth of the eugenic movement is not possible without substantial financial support. And it are uh, it is the capital from large corporation and and um, that 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 um, are being um, uh, used to 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 provide this funding. So Carnegie Institution is important. Rec Rockefeller Foundation. And the um, uh, Edward Henry Harriman fortune, there was a railroad um, um, capitalist who, who died and then his wife, Mary Williamson Harris, Harriman becomes really important as, as, a, as a sponsor uh, of this, this early eugenic movement. Um, once that is more or less in place, um, there is a shift towards the push for legislation that would work as a legitimation of this whole eugenic approach, and then more broadly, a set of policies. So what we see, for instance, the first um, law that's really based on eugenic thinking was in 1907 in Indiana. And here, this here uh, a typo. 1924, there is an immigration law that's also uh, really uh, applies eugenic notion to setting the boundaries of immigration to the United States. So many progressives then um, kind of uh, get eugenics on their screen. Eugenic thinking becomes increasingly important in uh, social sciences and in economics in particular. and, and um, progressives um, increasingly saw eugenics as a way to achieve their goals of social improvement through, you could say, a shortcut. Okay, so what kind of policies did the eugenicists um, propagate? So first they said, okay, when, when we have identified uh, those individuals, but also those family lines that are hereditary, uh, problematic, right, in the sense that 
families would um, have a, a tendency to become criminals, to become prostitutes, to uh, become blind, uh, that kind of thing. These families would have to be separated from society in, uh, in institutions. So segregation was an important first step in these policies. So set apart those who are considered deficient from the rest of the population um, in other institutions. Next step was uh, in 1907 decided upon to, uh, that, and that was forced sterilization. So if people were, um, um, uh, there was a decision made that they were deficient, um, uh, they were morons or idiots, then uh, they could be subject to forced sterilization. So since 19, 1907 to the 1960s, 70s, uh, there's this official number of 60,000 um, people that were um, uh, under, under, they were forcibly sterilized. But there's probably many, many, many more. So particularly applied, um, this, this policy was applied to uh, African-American, Puerto Rican and Native American women um, and whites also who were considered feeble-minded criminal death um, Moron. So the the criteria for which one could be um, uh, uh, decided upon that one would one was a moron, one was an idiot, or one was deficient in moral mm -hmm. character. Those, of course, it was very difficult to really set those boundaries, and they have been uh, the early decade of eugenic movement was focused particularly on that. And then a, a discussion that goes way back to the 19th century is the concern about immigration in the United States. So the aim was to protect the Anglo-Saxon Saxon Nordic race and to keep out what was called the low quality immigrants. So somebody like Richard Eli really writes extensively about this concern that something needs to be done because there are these immig uh, immigrants from Southern Eastern Europe, the Mediterranean races, that um, kind of mix up, mix up and, 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 and pollute the races, um, um, what they call the Native American races, which was, of course, they were not Native Americans, they were white Americans, which claimed to be native to the United States. Okay, and then as, a, as, a, as an extreme of aversion, uh, policies that get particularly applied in Nazi Germany, and Germany is the, um, the, the extinction of the whole groups of the population. We see that language coming, uh, popping up uh, over, over uh, the decades that um, eugenic thinking um, emerges. Okay. What you see here is that, um, yeah, I'll talk about that later. Good. So, um, eugenic thought in American economy. Um, what you see um, is that um, by the end of the 19th century, American economics um, kind of shares the idea that laissez faire is a good idea. Um, and, but a lot of people in the field have uh, more or less a religious background. And what happens uh, then is that a whole group, as you will be aware, uh, of um, new students, young young economists, come in from Germany. They have been, been trained by Smola and, and other German economists, and they also bring these evolutionary and these historical and eugenic notions into uh, economic thinking. So um, I think I have to speed up a little bit. So. Uh, a few of them I mentioned here, Francis Amasa Walker, really clearly, and he's, these are not, these are important, crucial figures in the emergence of the American uh, Economic Association. They're also presidents of the uh, Bureau of the Census. Um, Edward Ross is, um, yeah, I wanted to talk about that. Um, he is generally considered a sociologist, but he's also involved in the founding of the American Economic Association. And he's the one that coins the term race suicide. So race suicide is a kind of the flip over of this idea, this Darwinist idea that the, the survival of the fittest, right? If you have, according to, to the thinking of Darwin, you would have the strongest um, and most well-developed race would kind of um, um, be the winner of the competition. But now this changes because there's a recognition that um, the, uh, the, the, the 
birth rate under white middle mid, middle class and upper class white people declines faster than that under immigrants and under um, Africa, uh, African Americans. Um, the idea becomes um, uh, 180 degrees different, namely is that the deficient races will take over the more higher developed wise race, and that's called race suicide. Okay, Simon Patton, I don't know if you're familiar with him, he was the president of the American Economic Association in 1908. He talks about theory of abundance, he talks about con consumption, consumption of wealth, uh, and he really applies this whole uh, uh, thinking around eugenics, um, deficiency of populations and extinction of populations. And there are a few others. I think Fisher is actually um, stands out because he is important in the development of economic thought, but he's also, as, as a, his, his, the flip side of, of his life, you could say, he's really active in the propagation of the eugenics movement. Okay, so that's just a, a few, how strongly eugenics was represented in early economics. Okay, well, let's zoom in on abortion now. Um, just to give you a bit of a view of the um, of the land um, and the, the shifts in, 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 in the legal landscape. Um, in 1821, um, Connecticut comes up with the first law to criminalize abortion. Until then, abortion is kind of left free um, until the, 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 the quickening, right? We talked about that earlier on. Um, Miriam talked about that. Um, Marianne talked about that for Sweden. Um, in general, um, uh, people in, in, in involved in abortion are being left alone, except when deaths were involved, then, then people were pursued. So it's in 1857 that the American Medical Association launched a campaign to criminalize abortion, and in 1860 they passed a resolution condemning abortion at any stage, so there's a radicalization there. Uh, a, a strong voice in the field, Horatio Storer declares in eight years later, 1868, abortion to be murder at any stage. And he argues that because by, by uh, talking about the fetus um, and focusing on the fetus uh, as a being that is independent of the mother. So this is a shift away from concerns about the mother towards concerns about the fetus right. So the fetus is considered an independent unit surrounded by what he referred to as the inert matter of the womb. I think that's interesting to, to see how these are contrapositioned. Contra okay, in the 1980s, there is the New York Times sets up a campaign to go after providers, they interview women, they come up with horror stories around what happens um, during an abortion, which like we see today, most of them are, are just that, horror stories. But you see that there is a slow shift in, in, in attitude. In overall, what you can see is that in the medical profession, there's a double, double take on matters. Um, whereas the, the, the profession as such is rather string, stringent and saying, okay, um, abortion murder at any stage. Doctors, local doctors who know their patients still help, um, help them out to be fixed, uh, to get rid of the, of the, of the baby. Um, so we also see a difference in use of language. language. Uh, the term abortion is generally not used. Um, under women who uh, undergo this procedure, they uh, see, uh, speaking in general, abortion before quickening much more as part of the um, um, of, of the um, menstrual process. Okay, so abortion takes place, right? It's continuing taking place. And in 1904, there are six to 10,000 abortions still being induced in Chicago every year, just to give you one data point. And by 1920, there's still 20% of all pregnancies were aborted, and then mostly by married women. So these are women that already have children, uh, don't want to have more children due to financial situations and situation within the marriage. Um, so that is more or less what happens. And in that 1910, every state 
had an abor anti-abortion law. So you see that the legal um, regulation of abortion is really kind of taking over the United States. Kentucky is an exception. Uh, and after that, um, the uh, fight over contraception moves in. Um, and for instance, in 1921, Margaret Sanger starts the birth, birth control league. Okay, so let's look a little bit um, at progressive movement um, that comes up in the early 20th century, particularly in economics, right? So when we talk about progressive movement, this was clearly uh, the idea that there would be um, social change, improvement in social economic circumstances, improvement of human functioning. Uh, some had the end goal of perfectionism, right? The perfect human being in the perfect circumstance. So um, there's a, a, a distinct role of the state through regulation, through social programs, taxation and public education. And then very important in all this is the role of science. So science, is really brought in as a foundation on which these policies should be based. There's the gathering of data that all these progressive thinkers practically are involved in. And um, th there is an aim of social sciences that is directly mentioned and that is social control. So through social control, the environment could be controlled, uh, efficiency could be be uh, improved and waste could be prevented. So there's a lot of talk about efficiency and about prevention of waste as an aim of policy making. Okay, um, in talking about progressivism in early economics, I make a lot of use um, of uh, Thomas Lehrer's book, uh, which I found revealing um, the illiberal reformers, race, eugenics, and the American economics in the progressive era. Um, it's easy read, it's very informative, very well documented, I really recommend it. What he does, however, he makes a strong case that it's the progressives who were the creeps. <laughs> and who who used eugenics to do a quick job on 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 um, um, social change, and that they actually aimed at getting rid of those who could not make the competition. I think that link is too is too strong. Uh, I think that uh, initially the eugenic movement was really. Um, came about from a very conservative racist motivation. Um, and the progressives, in my view, kind of jumped on the wagon and some more than others and others and some were, were hesitant, but did not see another way because uh, eugenics language was had become so dominant in economics and elsewhere. Okay, so what you see is that progressive economics and progressive uh, activists um, they go along and they think it's actually a good idea to have a separate legislation for women, right? So this, this, this distinction between the private realm, which was seen as dominated by women, women were seen as the guardian of morality in the private realm, uh, whereas the public realm is dominated by men, that division of spheres is really accepted by progressive thinkers. And I think that was a highly problematic move at the time. Women were um, perceived as, in that sense, uh, again, I mentioned that, um, uh, less developed as men and as uh, they had to be considered as, sep as a separate category, right? So they deserved a separate legislation that in order to protect them as the biological weaker sex from the hazards of market work to protect working women from the temptation of prost prostitution, right? If they would be engaging in paid work, they would be working with men, they would engage men, they would uh, be in the streets um, and they would, um, I don't know how that would work, but they would be tempted tempted in, in uh, to, to engage in prostitutions. So it would be better if they were to be just working at home. Uh, it would protect male heads of the household from economic competition of women, and it, it would ensure that women returned to the home could be better carrying out, you know, to have the time to really do their duties as mothers of the race, which was considered their main role in life. Okay. So there are a whole set of feminist 
thinkers and activists at a time that work in uh, NGOs, in unions, in, 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 in policy think tanks. Some also work in economic departments, but then they mostly work at the home economics departments, which would focus on um, the, the, the household behavior, right? Uh, but these thinkers, um, Applied eugenic reasoning, and Charlotte Perkins Gilman is somebody who's always mentioned in this uh, this respect um, because she really built her theory on women and economics on eugenic notions. And so, uh, others I already mentioned: Beatrice Watt Webb and Sydney Webb in the book *Industrial Democracy*. Ellen Richards is interesting in this respect. She is the the leader, you can say, of what's called the home economics movement. Uh, and she writes this book, Euthenics, which is kind of a, a variation on eugenics. And she says, yeah, eugenics is purely uh, biologically hereditary, uh, but we want to control the environment in order to, 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 to make, um, to, to force individuals to, to civilize, so to say. But her, her notions, her, her theoretical conceptual framework is practically that of, of the eugenics, uh, eugenicist theorists. Um, but she is able, with her movement, to bring in institutions in, for instance, the, the Department of Agriculture, uh, a Bureau for Home Economics, a Bureau, bureau for Child Care, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then she also, she and her movement also claim a place in economics, and they are, to some extent, able to um, bring home economics departments to departments, and that is where the research on households then takes place. So Elizabeth Hoyt is one of these um, uh, women. She's a PhD of uh, Hazel Kirk, who, who writes a book on the consumption of wealth. And she, because she was trained by a set of uh, eugenic uh, economists, she takes over their, their, their uh, research theory. Um, think of what you what you may. Um, um, this is what she does. Um, and yeah, I think it's when you're trained like that, it's kind of obvious that you have a tendency to, to keep on doing what you're doing. So that may be also a thing to think about. Okay, so the last one I want to mention is Margaret Sanger. Um, I think we should con consider her a uh, um, um, women economic writer. Uh, she's not an economist in the sense that she gets a job in an economics department. There are hardly any women who got a job at women's um, at, at economics department at the time. Um, but she is uh, very important in the um, in the women's movement, and she kind of starts the movement for birth control. Um, it's not that long ago that there is a realization that she heavily builds on eugenic thinking. So. Um, what she does is she publishes um, um, a booklet, Family Limitation, 1914. And in this, in this booklet, she defends, she really takes the, 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 the angle of the working class women. So she speaks up for working class women. And she says, working class women should be the ones that make the decision about their uh, reproduction. Um, and uh, they have to uh, be able to choose whether to uh, have an abortion or not. So she's very explicit about that. She gets into problems with the law. She gets arrested a few times, uh, and she really gets pushed back from 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 um, from uh, government um, um, from the direction of the government. Over the years, you see that she shifts her, her perspective. So um, until 1921, she really kind of reorientates herself, steps away from the from the working class, and orientates herself more and more towards middle class, upper class audience. Audience, among other reasons, uh, that, that that is where she gets her funding from. The impact on the content um, reflects in the fact that um, she um, steps away from, from, take, uh, from using controversial language uh, and she stops talking about abortion um, because that is, she finds that that kind of harms her case. So other among uh, another publication from her is Women and the New Race, which also, and by now you will recognize that, um, heavily built on eugenic uh, analysis. Um, and she uh, uh, articulates there her position on abortion. Uh, she still supports women 
who um, have abortions um, and she perceives that as, as being applied as, um, as um, a means of last resort and applied by those women who have a feminine urge to freedom, whose feminine urge to freedom is the strongest, right? So there again, you see the eugenic language coming in. Okay, she starts a Negro project. I, I mean, eugenics and, and these notions are all over the place. So what she uh, what she does is she really is able to build up a very strong movement, and she gets into conversation with the American eugenics movement, and she wants to merge. So the eugenics movement heavily controlled by men, and they're very hesitant. They don't want that, and then they kind of figure out that. Um, when they move slightly more into discussing uh, positive eugenics, Margaret Sanger totally cannot go there because that would stimulate um, um, the having of children uh, and she doesn't want to go there. So that's where the deal breaks and that, ne that merge never happened. Okay, so let me wrap up and see what I can make of this thus far. I feel a lot more research needs to be done, but um, I think we can kind of conclude this far that progressive used eugenic reasoning that was inherently sexist, classist, and racist. And they assigned to women the role of mother and responsibility for the birthing and raising of children. So under progressives, women became perceived as the experts on household issues and consumption. And um, in the field of economics, home economists were not considered economic experts, right? So you get this task division in which uh, economists kind of um, negotiate of what goes into home economics and what stays in economics. Progressive economists perceive the state as a tool for change and data collection, um, as for instance, through the Census Bureau as a means to provide a scientific basis for policy making. Uh, economists continue, when you read the material of these early economists, uh, continue to analyze the household as represented by the male head of the household. Also, Hazel Henderson in a theory of, uh, theory of consumption, there is still this ongoing notion until the very end of the book that, that, that focuses, talks about the behavior, consumer behavior in the household in terms of the male head of the household, which is interesting okay abortion generally dealt with in silence this is really really ultra private matter right it's dealt with in terms of secret silence or as in terms of horror to kind of um, scare people about about the terrible practices around um child mutilation, uh, we would say uh, post-birth abortion, uh, this kind of propaganda that we also have today. Um, but the person in general was increasingly dealt with as a legal issue, right, by the states, and it was enforced by local authorities. Okay, in the struggle of reproductive rights, the women's movement separates abortion out from the struggle for contraceptives. So it steps away in general from abortion and it propagates contraceptives as a sound means for family limitations. This is my last few sentences. Uh, economics as a field moves into a different direction, away from including population as an inherent part of the field. So as Simon Patton already states in 1895, by the time this final proposition that was Malta's take on the effects of overpopulation was fairly before the public, the basis of the discussion was shifted from economic to biologic grounds. Malthusianism became Darwinism and the economists were freed from any need to discussing the law of population as a special problem of their own science. So that's in my view what happens. And then later on, it takes a few decades, but then it's Becker with his economic approach, right? I mean, it talked about that. Who comes back talking again about population issues, demographic issues, but then in terms of this much more narrow approach of the economic approach. Okay, I would like to leave it here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been a fascinating discussion. And I think we can open it now uh, for questions and comments.
You can uh, raise your hand or simply turn off your uh, or turn on your microphone. I have a question. Yes. Thank you, Ed, for the presentation. It was very, very interesting. Uh, so first, I have two questions. The one is a very specific one. At the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned then um, something related with Darwin that women were uh, more focused on sexual selection. What does it mean exactly? I, I don't know the meaning of that. And second, this is something that I start thinking during the presentation the um, the link between the development of the movement of rights for children and this idea that the fetus has rights so how you can put those together because at the time that they start moving this idea that the fetus has rights at the same time the movement for uh, children rights was almost unexistent those were my two questions. Thank you. Okay, thanks Camilla. Thank you. Um, yeah, the fact that, that uh, Darwin's ideas around um, women being more oriented to, to sex selection, um, that um, kind of, um, uh, Perkins Gilman also talks talks about that quite a bit, um, is that, that um, women were, um, first place aimed at reproduction and getting a partner and, and, and finding, um, 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 being involved in, 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 in the reproduction of, of, of the race, so to say. Whereas men were um, more oriented to, um, to uh, competition in the economy, in 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 building civilization, that kind of things. So there, he kind of separates out the the the, the two sexes and their aims and what 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 their lives are about. Yeah, does it make sense? Yes. Um, the movement of the right of children. Um, yes, I didn't make that link. Um, so I didn't look at that, which is interesting, right? Um, I think that is that is interesting. What I kind of suspect is that um, this takes place earlier, before real movement of the right of children. Um, I think this is well, this is speculation, but um, 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 talking about the rights of the fetus in order to be able to get away from uh, the right to choose for women and to control their reproductivity uh, seems to be more pra pragmatically uh, motivated by me. But I don't know to what extent that is linked to the discussion around the um, uh, rights of children, uh, to the concerns about women, uh, children's labor at that time. Uh, I don't know. So there is a, a, a discourse that I, that, that I think is, is, is a nice idea to check that. Thank you. Yeah. We have a question in the chat from Raphael about how influential the ideas of the American economists were for other countries. Right? And he notes that there were already money doctors in the 1920s, right, advising uh, countries around the world. Were there also eugenics doctors, for example? Okay. <laughs> uh, can you help me seeing a question in that? Um, uh, I mean, we're talking about 1920s. That is already late when eugenics thinking has been very strongly evolved um, and that will be reflected in the in the um, in the medical profession as I I, I I definitely think that will be the case or did I mention a question did I miss the question that is in there Daniel yeah, hi, thanks. This was a great presentation. You you mentioned um, when you were going through the 
the economist initially and you came to Keynes, you mentioned something about his reluctance on some of these issues, despite being uh, leading the eugenic society. And, and that's kind of been my impression as well. It's, it's hard to pin down exactly what Keynes thought on eugenics. And the same goes with anti-Semitism. It's, it's a little um, fluid and, and hard, hard to pin down. So I was hoping you could say a little bit more about your, your perspective on how far Keynes went with eugenics. Um, um, I kind of agree with you, you know, I, I didn't look up Keynes to, to see what he does there. Um, he, uh, had hesitations to re as far as I know, to really, um, reduce kind of economic choices, poverty, uh, and employment to, to her hereditary features. Uh, he says it's more a matter of prob probability. Uh, he, he, you see these eugenic notions popping up here and there. So um, I would, I would kind of, from where I'm, I'm standing now, I would, I would categorize him in, in in the group of economists who make use of these notions because they are around. Uh, that he didn't particularly propagate them, um, but um, um, just use them because they are there. Um, I don't think he, was, although he might have made some statements that are more crudely eugenic. So, but I cannot assist um, uh, Keynes. It's kind of interesting though, um, because, um, because Keynes is such a big economist and because um, how would these notions have, have kind of really kind of structured his, structured his, his economic concepts, right? I think that is the, that's the big question here. How have these economic, uh, these eugenic notions structure and got themselves into our definition of concepts and, and, and theories that then later become invisible uh, when we start using these concepts and theories outside the context in which they emerged? Thank you. Uh, Rebecca? Yes, thank you, Edith, for your presentation. I, I'm, I'm very happy to see too many people today, despite the, the time uh, changes. Um, yeah, I have many, many questions, but maybe, maybe let me focus on two. First, only to, to better understand what, what is exactly your criticism to, um, to um, Tim Leonard uh, analysis in illiberal reformers, if you can just just oh, tell me tell me again please um okay okay well if you if you read the book um it, it's a bit it's a bit um which is which is fine but it's a bit of a crusade against against um uh, early economists that wanted to use economic thinking and economic policy making to improve the world to use the government, the government policies to improve economic life for a lot of groups and people. So, um, and I'm still not entirely clear where where he wants to go with this argument. Um, the, it seems that he's, you know, hesitant uh, about government policies, about government interference, because he says, well, you know, this this can only end end badly. Um, um, but because I think that 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 commitment, that passion of his, which also kind of drove him to do the research anyway, it's my assessment, and that brought us his book, which I think is really a strong a strong contribution. Um, but I I think that that um, that the eugenics movement does not have its basis in progressivism, uh, the progressive movement or progressive economists, or that a progressive economists found themselves on eugenic thinking, but that there is an, an earlier point where conservative forces, cons racist thinking really brings about eugenic thinking, takes over the discipline, and that kind of uh, defines the language that progressives then make use of. That is a defense of progressive economists and thinkers that you, you know, they're not innocent. I can see that. There is a, quite a few feminist thinkers and activists, but also economists that that 
use this concept that really downgrading and 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 uh, talking about extinction of groups, I think it's highly problematic. Um, and so I think this deserves an analysis and assessment of okay, what were these people doing? To what extent was this eugenics and how has it impacted, had it impact, how did it impact their economic thinking and reasoning? And I also think that, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about the repetition of history. Um, we would want to know how these things work. Right, I think the, the 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 whole theorizing around the welfare state there is there is a strong injection of eugenic thinking there, and I think that as progressives ourselves, at least I would see myself in the in that tradition. I would like to know where this eugenic thinking has structured the reasoning, the arguments, the theory, the approach, in order to prevent it happening again. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, yeah, my, other, my other question is linked to um, religion and politics, because I have the impression that um, when we discuss about reproductive rights, uh, many times religion is very, very present or, and politics is a, is a political question and sometimes, we have uh, in Congress uh, some or some presidents that makes this topic like their political uh, issue. Uh, of course, don't take into account at all uh, the role of women, the role of, I mean, the happiness of the of the people in the country, etc. So, do you have what what is the the place of religion uh, among these eugenics? Uh, eugenist economies, for example, because I have the impression that religion apparently is not very present. So this is why, for example, in the case that I'm studying Irving Fisher, he can accept, or Charlotte Perkin Gilman, she can accept in some cases abortion because the religion is absent. So it's not a it's not an evil, it's not a problem, they, you, you don't have a punition in the other life because you're not Catholic, Jewish, Muslim, etc. So religion is one topic that I, I would like to, to, to hear you about. And the other one is politics, because you know, it's uh, in particular in the United States, with uh, there is apparently this link very strong between the Republicans uh, in, against and Democrats in favor in the time evolution. We saw this in other webinars that we organized. Um, so I want to hear you about this. Thank you. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. I think it plays a role. Uh, I mentioned very briefly, but that's, I'm not here to defend myself. Um, um, what I said was that um, most economists before this stream of economists comes in from Germany, right? Most economists in the United States had a, to more or lesser extent, knowledge, background, training in religion. Um, and, um, and then these economists that, uh, and more general, uh, this, this Darwinism starts to replace religion as a basis for economic reasoning. I think that is definitely what, 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 what is going on. Um, and that is, that is very, very strong. Like they don't have to base themselves on some kind of you know, philosopher like Hegel or, um, uh, but they can now base themselves on this, on this scientific theory of, of evolution or social evolution, or um, when you add um, uh, statistical info, uh, data, you can even base yourself on, on objective facts, right? And then what you see is that, that economics takes up this, this, this aim to become more and more objective. And with that, that, that effort, they take distance from uh, policymakers, from those who are involved in, in activism. And, and that also has, has an impact for, for, for women and research they do and consumer research because women were marginalized in economic science. They were over represented in, uh, in, in departments, uh, in departmental research, in policy research, and that kind of makes them uh, becoming even more marginalized. Um, so I think I think there's definitely a story there. 
yes, uh, on, on the role of religion and how people negotiate that and, and bring that in. Uh, actually, when I kind of um, go back, um, I think um, economies in the United States may make more use than you would think about religious notions. So it's kind of interesting to see to how long it's still plays a role. Um, other question was, no, I think that was your question, right? Okay, thank you. Okay, do we have other questions for Edith? Laura. Yeah. Okay. Laura, we cannot hear you. Yeah. Turn on your mic. No. No. Try now. Yes, yes. Okay. I think so. Uh, I have a question. It has to do with the the use of race in the 19th century. Sometimes it's used in a cultural uh, way and not a physical, biological way. And I I have no doubt that Marshall had something to do with eugenics, but the quotations you get, you can see like similar things in John Stuart Mill that certainly had nothing to do nothing with to this do with biological it. sense of the lower races. But he obviously thought that, you know, the uh, European were more developed than uh, at the time, mm -hmm. the black population or the Irish population, but not mm -hmm. because of a biological trait, but because of the institutions and things like that. So, uh, yeah. I had, you know, just one a little note on that. Okay. Yeah, so so um I also think that's a good point because that whole kind of the racial issue is of is way older than 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 when eugenics comes up in the in the early uh, late 19th century, early 20th century. So you you definitely have a, I, I totally agree with that point. Um, uh, so it's good to distinguish between evolutionary thought, which kind of, and then even, you know, John Stuart Mill, um, I, I don't know to what extent he makes use of evolutionary thought could be, um, but that it's that, um, uh, and eugenics, because these are definitely not one and the same, right? Um, and uh, because, if you kind of glue these together, that that will lead to, to the confusion. And the interest is mainly in 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 kind of getting a grip on on how eugenic reasoning kind of because that got off the rails and it 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 ended up in in, in really bad policy making and in disaster eventually. So uh, and and my feeling is that evolutionary thought as such doesn't have to have uh, automatically that kind of um outcomes or um, um connotations so so but it's, it's it's an interesting line it's kind of a logical question to say okay when did eugenics get on the wagon to some extent okay there's rationalizations legitimations um going on Right, so fake notions that people already had, and now they found a uh, scientific approach to to kind of show that they were right. Um, that kind of stuff will is definitely been going on. Okay, and there's one thing that that maybe I can I have a question about if people kind of run into that. That's Rebecca's question about about religion. And um, that is that I have not yet been able to kind of write a really founded link. Um, and that is a link, the, the fact that um, uh, the, the, the um, Christian evangelicals, right, have jumped on the wagon of abortion rights. That seemed to have been a rather pragmatic choice uh, of the Republican Party. Yeah, so it's a very interesting kind of uh, play with these big, big groups in United States society. Um, what um, the choice to make abortion rights so crucial in these two population groups, what, what made them go for abortion? Um, and um, to what extent it was racism uh, an underlying cause for that. That is that's just something I'm I'm still chewing on and I don't know the answer yet. 
I, and and uh, oh, please, yeah, yeah, no, only we we find uh, sometimes we find the same in um, evangelic groups in other countries, in particular, I, I'm thinking in Venezuela, in Brazil, that also mm -hmm. there is a link between evangelic and abortion. So yeah, for me, this is also intriguing. Uh, so if I if I have some answer, or if you have some answer, please tell mm -hmm. me, and we okay. All right, uh, any question, last question perhaps, uh, given the time? Right. Uh, well then, uh, I think we would like to thank you very much, Edith. This has been a great discussion, uh, quite fascinating. I have a list of things to, uh, okay. to write you about uh, as soon as I have a few minutes, there you go. Uh, so very thought provoking. Um, it's really a pleasure to have you here today, and uh, I hope you have a lovely stay in uh, London or Cambridge, really, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. It was great to, right. to be here. Thank you. See you <laughs> soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.